Fed up with shoveling snow? Can't shake that cold of yours? Want to get away from it all? We offer you escape. You were alone in a remote village on the Welsh border, surrounded by silent townspeople who were watching and waiting for you to decide to lose your soul. Escape, produced by William N. Robeson and carefully contrived to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Today we escape to a remote section of Wales and a strange village between two worlds. As Algernon Blackwood described it in his eerie story, Ancient Sorceries. I had spent a week's vacation in Wales and was returning to London by train when it all began. It was late afternoon. We'd left the Welsh mountains and crossed the border into Western England, passing through a countryside which appeared singularly empty, deserted of life. Over the soft hills and the valleys between hung a faintly perceptible haze, giving to the whole landscape a feeling of enchantment and unreality. The train slowed at length to stop at a tiny wayside station. As it did so, a sudden thought occurred to me. Why not leave the crowded train with its irritating noises and spend the night in this peaceful spot, then take a slower and emptier train in the morning? On the impulse, I rose from my seat, and the man sitting opposite me said, uh, Why, say, sir, hmm? we only stop here for a minute or two. If you were thinking of walking about a bit. No, I, matter of fact, I'm getting off here. I thought you were going to London. I'll go on in the morning. I'm going to stay here for the night. I strongly advise you not to. I beg your pardon? This is the village of Malton. Malton? I've never heard of it. Few people have, outside. But if you place any value on your soul, you'll not spend the night here. <laughs> what are you talking about? Why not? Because of the sleep and because of the cats. That's all I can tell you. You're insane. I'll take my bag now, if you don't mind. You're making a terrible mistake. You may, you may not even get the chance to regret it. Don't leave this train. I know what I'm talking about. Oh, what utter nonsense. Don't. Don't, I tell you. Goodbye. Boy! I stood there on the embankment as the train pulled away. <laughs> what was the matter with the man, anyway? Cats, sleep. His words made no sense. I picked up my bag and started walking up the long hill toward the village, and suddenly, for no reason at all, I... I shivered. Hello. Hello, is anyone here? Yes. Oh. oh, I didn't see you at first. Is there something I can do for you, sir? Why, yes. I, I saw your sign outside the Inn of the Golden Bow. I should like to get a room. You're planning to stay here? Why, yes. <laughs> Very well. Give me sign the register. Yeah. Thank you. I'm... I'm going to catch another train and go on in the morning. Yes, of course. There we are. Arthur Llewellyn. Llewellyn? Yes, from London. Arthur Llewellyn. You've been a long time coming back. What? But now that you're here, you'll find there are some things that never change. Madam, I, I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about. You uh, rang, madam? Dundreary, the gentleman would like a room for the night. 
His name is Arthur Llewellyn. Aye, so it is. Welcome back to Malton, sir. I knew I'd never been here before. What was it all about? First the men on the train, and now these people. Were they crazy, or was I? Oh well, I left the inn and walked along narrow cobbled streets, beneath quaint gables leaning out from the silent shuttered houses, through dappled pools of light and shadow. As I walked, it gradually dawned upon me that the village of Malton was centuries old, older than any town in England ought to be. And the people I passed now and then were dressed in the fashion of another day. They paid no attention to me, went silently about their own business. Yes, that was it. That's what I'd been noticing. Silently. As I walked, I noticed they came and went with only soft padding sounds to mark their passing, as though they walked in shoes with soles of velvet. When I stopped, there was no sound. The silence was unbroken. I hurried through the streets and came at last to the far side of the village, to a place where the hill broke away sharply from a low, flat wall of stone, perhaps a rampart once. I sat down upon it, and the dreamy tranquility of the place stole over me. Presently, I don't know how much later, I became aware of the sound of weird music rising out of the vale below me. I looked down from the rampart. The sunken plain at the bottom melted away into a sea of gathering shadow, blurred into a swirl of thickening mist. I thought of dead trees swept by the night wind, of animals with half-human voices singing to a white moon, of the wailing of cats on the roof tiles at night, of unearthly creatures far off in the sky calling to one another in chorus. I. I felt my heart beat faster and faster, felt the vague stirrings of some urge inside of me trying to answer the awful call of that music. I fought against the feeling, fought against myself, and even as I did, I, I found I was staring down into that valley, peering desperately into the dark mist, trying to see I, I don't know what. And then suddenly, the music ended. I stood on the rampart alone, dusk fallen about me, and the early night wind moaned with a chill breath. Quick terror rose up in me. I turned and ran on through the darkened streets, ran with heart pounding, dodging its shadows, through one dim alley after another, and arrived at last panting and almost breathless at the door of the Golden Bow. You've been a long time returning, Mr. Llewellyn. It's past seven. Yes, I... I guess I walked farther than I meant to. I didn't realize it was so late. You heard the music, didn't you? Yes. Yes, the strangest music I've ever heard. How did you know? Who plays it, anyway? Then you didn't remember it? No. Why should I? The thing was becoming irritating, this quiet insistence that I was someone else. I went into my lonely dinner and ate as quickly as possible. Then, taking the candle Dundreary gave me, I crossed the lobby, climbed the stairs behind the desk, and walked past silent doors down the long, empty hall that led to my room at the end. I was halfway to my door when suddenly the flame of my candle went out. I stood stock still in the pitch blackness, fumbling for a match. And at that moment, I knew that someone or something was there with me in the darkness. I held my breath and listened. There was no sound, no movement. I reached out and found the wall and moved along and feeling my way in the inky blackness. It was then I, I touched it. Near my face, another soft, warm yielding. And alive. Who? Who is it? It is I. Ilsa. Who? Ilsa. Don't you remember me, Arthur? No. No. <laughs> but wouldn't you like to remember me? 
Don't you want to see me again? To look at me? No. I... I don't know. <laughs> but not tonight, Arthur. Perhaps tomorrow. 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 <laughs> I stumbled blindly through the door of my room and shut it behind me. I lit the candle and flung myself across the bed. The room was small, with one shuttered window and the light of the flame flickered on the walls and ceiling. I stared at the hand that had touched her out there in the dark hall. I lifted it to my face and smelled the barbaric scent that still clung to my fingers. It was evil and maddening. The candle sputtered and burned, and the melted minutes dripped away. Who was I? Who were these people? Who was Ilsa? I fell asleep finally, and dreamed of soft, moving creatures, and the silence of life in a dim, muffled world devoid of all feeling but ecstasy. And I dreamed, too, of cats. You've slept quite late this morning, Mr. Llewellyn. Morning, Don Drury. I, I felt as though I'd been drugged. The night air here in Malton is very conducive to sleep. I'd meant to catch the morning train to London. Now it's too late. What a terrible shame. Yes, I... Oh, by the way, Dundrini... Yes, Mr. Llewellyn? Do you... I... I mean, I was wondering if you'd know anyone by the name of... Ilsa. Ilsa happens to be my daughter, Mr. Llewellyn. Oh, I... I didn't hear you come in. I hope you were able to sleep well... without unpleasant dreams. I guess so. I... I'm so happy to hear it. Perhaps then you may decide to stay with us for a long time. That's, that's very kind of you. No, it's not kindness, Mr. Llewellyn. But all of us are hoping that you may decide soon. Decide? Decide what? It was no use. None of them would answer my questions. They seem to think I should know already. I left the inn as soon as I'd eaten, walked around the streets of the village. I began to notice I was never completely alone. If I turned down an empty street, someone always stepped from a doorway or entered from the opposite end. Wherever I went, within five minutes, a dozen people were strolling near me. And I realized these people were watching me tensely as a cat watches a mouse, or another cat. It's quite fortunate you came back early, Mr. Llewellyn. Your dinner this evening is a rather special one. Special? What do you mean by that? You ought to have a guest. Oh, who? An old friend. She's coming now. The girl who came toward us across the room was lithe and slim. She moved with the sinuous grace of a young panther. She was lovely, exotic, and terrifyingly beautiful. May I present Mr. Arthur Llewellyn, Miss Ilsa? He's been with us for two days. Yes, I know. My mother told me. May I sit down, Mr. Llewellyn? Hmm? Oh. Oh, yes, please do. Here, yeah, permit me. Thank you. You may serve us, Dundreary. Thank you, Miss Ilsa. Then, you're Ilsa? Yes. Don't you remember me, Arthur? From last night. It was you last night, wasn't it? Yes, and other nights. Can't you remember all the other nights? No. No. 
Then we shall have to try that much harder. It's been such a very long time. Please, Ilsa. What is it all of you talk about? I, I don't understand any of it. You will, Arthur. Unless you leave, of course. Weren't you planning to take a train to London in the morning? Yes. Uh, no. No, I've changed my mind. <laughs> I'm glad you did. We'll try to make you happy here, my mother and I. And then perhaps you'll stay a long, long time. No. I must leave for sure in a day or two. Suppose we wait and see. And meanwhile, if there's anything you want, all you have to do is ask me. All right. Why don't you tell me about... Uh... Yes, Arthur. About what? No. No, I don't want to know. I don't want you to tell me. Suddenly I realized I was afraid to know. I was afraid. I should leave now, but I couldn't leave. It was Ilsa. She attracted, repelled, fascinated, and horrified me, all in single flashes of blasting emotion. I felt the presence of a great gray curtain ready to roll back at any moment and leave me on the brink of an awful adventure. And I knew the village held its breath, watched and waited. And then on the evening of the fifth day, the whole ghastly secret exploded into hideous life. After dinner, Ilsa had asked me to walk with her. It was the first time I'd been outside the inn after dark. We walked through the village in the moonlight, saying very little, and came finally to the stone rampart above the sunken plain. We were quite alone. Look, Arthur, hmm? it's a full moon tonight. Do you know what that means? Yes. It means I can see more clearly how beautiful you are. Do you really believe that? Do you think I'm beautiful? Hmm. Like a soft, sleek leopard and a warm jungle of shadows. But wait, I'll see you even better in a moment. Arthur, what are you doing? These dry leaves by the wall. They'll make an excellent bonfire. There. There, you see? No. No. What's wrong? The fire. No, Arthur, put it out. All right, Ilsa. Don't worry, it's all right. There. Didn't even get a chance to get started. There, you see, it's out. Yes, I see. Why did it bother you so much? Don't you remember? Don't you remember the fire? No. What fire? Oh. No. Don't talk of it. Look at me instead. Look at me, Arthur. Yes, Ilsa? Arthur, do you love me? Yes. Yes, Ilsa, I... I love you. I'm glad. That means you'll come back to us, then. I don't know what you mean, Ilsa. You can know everything tonight, if you want to. Yes, I do. I do, Ilsa. You must know a part of it already, down inside. You must remember some of it, don't you? Yes. It's like something buried for centuries, deep inside of me. Now it's beginning to come alive. Let it come alive. Don't fight against it. You belonged to us once, long ago, and you still belong. Yes. I seem to know that. That's why you came back. You heard me calling. You heard them calling. And you came seeking the old life again. Yes, but... Ilsa, I, I'm afraid. Are you afraid of me? Look at me. Ilsa. Will you live the old life again? With me tonight? Yes. Yes. Oh, I've known that you would, because I own you, Arthur. You yes. belong to me, and I want you to come with me. I shall never let you escape from me again. Yes, yes. Go back to the inn, then. Wait for me, Arthur. I shall come for you tonight. Back at the inn, I paced the floor of my room, 
a tense, uncontrollable excitement driving me along in a nervous frenzy. The dry crypt of the memory had broken open and all the things I'd hidden away for centuries poured into my consciousness. I knew now why I'd come here. I knew what I was going to do. And I knew that I was lost. I sensed the rising stir of movement throughout the inn and outside in the courtyard below my window. I knew what to expect when I threw open the window. From every window of the inn and from those of the houses about the court were leaping great monstrous beasts with soft dark fur and eyes that gleamed with eerie phosphorescence. Cats! Cats of human size! This was the secret of Molten. Lycanthropy. The witchcraft of centuries long dead and buried. The half-human cries floated up to me and the moon cast their dark shadows on the ground as they padded across the courtyard and vanished through the narrow streets of the village, heading for a hideous rendezvous. This is what I'd been. This is what I wanted to be now. <laughs> I scarcely heard the door of the room open behind me. Are you ready, my love? Shall we join them? Yes. Here, Arthur, the sacred bomb made of a vein and mistletoe and blind things out of the sea. Remember? Yes. Yes, I remember. Take it. Use it. We'll change now. Transform. Leap from the window and join them. Lead us again, Arthur. Yes. But not here, Ilsa. Not yet. Wait until we get there. Then we'll change. If you wish. Come then, Arthur, to the stone wall above the grove. That's where we'll change, on the stone rampart. <laughs> In the grove on the sunken plain beneath the wall, insane shadows writhed in the moonlight and postured in the luminous mist. A thousand of the devil's own were dancing in an unearthly music, born from the harmony of the black sacrifice, crying out in delirious abandon, calling to the thing that now lived inside of me and struggled screaming in my skull, trying to answer them back. I fought against them, fought against Ilsa, pleading and clinging with her soft arms about my neck. No. Now, Arthur, come with me now, if you love me. I love you, but I can't do it. I can't do it. Not again, Ilse. Yes, my love. Only an instant to change, and then we'll live forever. Is it living without a soul? Does it matter when I'm here? No. No, once before I escape. But I could never escape again. This time there'd be no turning back. Am I not worth it? Look at me. Look at me, my love. I clung to the very edge of sanity. Thought that I'd not be lost and damned forever. And at that very moment, I knew... Knew what Arthur, I could do. Wait. What are you doing? I found a match in my pocket, struck it, dropped it into the dry leaves that lay banked along the whole length of the stone wall. No. No, Arthur, don't. I can't come to you through the fire. You're driving me away. Yes, go. Go into the valley, Ilsa. Goodbye, Ilsa. Goodbye. You fool. You fool. I turned from the wall of flame that for a few minutes would shut me off from the valley, ran through the moonlit streets, not back toward the inn of the Golden Bar, but down the long road that led away from that cursed village of Malton. Well, Mr. Llewellyn, I find this one of the most interesting cases of hallucination I've encountered since I began the practice of psychiatry. I tell you, it really happened, Doctor. And having investigated your story a bit during the past week, I'm in a position now to answer most of the questions that have been worrying you since you came back to London. What do you mean, investigated? I went up to Hereford and looked over some of the old records there. And then I motored over to Malton for a couple of hours. Well, then you know it's all true. You saw it. You know I was there. Oh, there's no question but what you were there, Mr. Llewellyn. The lady who runs the inn showed me your name in the register. Said you'd left quite suddenly without taking your luggage or paying your bill. <laughs> she was really quite put out. I see. Well, what about the records, Doctor? The ones you spoke of? I think they really explain the whole thing, Mr. Llewellyn. It seems that during the 14th century... 
The village of Malton became a kind of headquarters in that part of the country for the practice of witchcraft. Yes. Go on. Numerous trials were held there in the late 1300s, and a great many men and women were convicted of sorcery and burned to death. Yes. In the records of a trial in 1372, I found the name of an Arthur Llewellyn and of Ilsa and her mother. That proves it, then. It proves a clear case of hallucination. You knew that story before you went there, not consciously, but somewhere down in your latent memory. I knew nothing of it before. That man was an ancestor of yours. The story must have been known in your family. When you arrived in Malton accidentally, the association of the name just pulled the trigger, and your imagination did the rest. But, Doctor, my my parents died when I was four. I, I've never been around any of my family. No matter. You see, a childhood memory is amazingly persistent at times. Yes. Yes, I suppose it is. I knew then what I had to do. The only thing I could do. There'd be no use in talking further with the doctor. He'd find some phrase of science to cover everything. He'd even try to explain away the mark I still carried across my shoulder, where Ilse had thrown her arm about me in those last mad minutes on the rampart. A mark that was covered with a soft gray fur, like the fur of a cat. Yes, I knew now what had to be done, and must be done while I still retain my sanity. One last act final and irrevocable. An act that begins by walking into the railway station at Charing Cross. Good evening, sir. May I help you? Yes. I'd like a ticket to Malton. Malton? I don't believe I have... It's a village on the Swansea line near the border of Wales. Oh, yes. Yes, here it is. I don't believe I've ever sold a ticket to Malton before. I don't doubt it. Let's see now. Four and six. Single fare. First class. Did you wish a return? Or one way? What did you say? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I... Make it... One way. Escape. Produced by William N. Robeson and directed by Norman MacDonald, today brought you Ancient Sorceries by Algernon Blackwood. Adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield, with Paul Fries as Arthur Llewellyn, Kay Brinker as Ilsa, Anne Morrison as Madam, and William Conrad as The Doctor. Music is conceived by Cy Feuer with Eddie Dunstetter at the console. Next week... After you've had a hard day at the office or bending over a hot stove, next week at this time, when your problems seem too much for you, we offer you Escape. Next week, we bring you another exciting story of high adventure. Goodbye, then, until this same time next week when once again we offer you Escape. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week. The Columbia Broadcasting System.